Hello and welcome back to episode 50 of the Smoking Snake podcast. This is the only English language podcast all about Brazilian football. I am your host, Peter, joined as always by the other co-host, Enric. But once again, we are not alone. We are joined by a very special guest. Uh, He is um, a fellow Midwestern American and a passionate supporter of Flamengo. He's amassed thousands of followers across Twitter uh, and YouTube, and he creates weekly content on YouTube as well as day-to-day tweeting all about Flamengo in English. Welcome to the podcast, Flamengo's number one American fan, Owen Sullivan. Owen, how are you? I'm good. Thank you for having me on. I'm really excited. This is my first podcast ever. I'm happy to talk about Flamengo and see where this goes. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for joining us. And we got to throw it over to Enric. Enric, how are you doing today? He's rocking a very nice Flamengo shirt. Hey, guys. How are you? I'm doing well. And as always, uh, thanks, Owen, for joining. And you're our fellow American friend, as Peter said. And it's surprising that it's taken 50 episodes to talk to you. And you live so close to us as well, like not too, too far, like maybe a couple hours. So very excited to, to discuss about Flamengo here. First question that I want to ask you, uh, Owen, uh, is you talked to me before about how you fell in love with Flamengo, but now you got to do it here on the show. Uh, you said that your first match uh, was in Maracanã after you visited Brazil a couple of years ago. So I want you to explain how was that for you and is that what made you support the team and How did your love for Flamengo begin at all? Well, yeah, that's the golden question. So I was at the Maracanã, but I actually did not get to see a match as it was more of a tour of the stadium. But I'll I'll go down the long version of the story as I often only give people the short snippets. So the real answer is that my girlfriend is originally from Brazil and that opened the opportunity in 2021 for me to go to Brazil for the first time, go to Rio, where she's originally from. And I did not have much of a knowledge of Flamengo before I landed in Santos Dumont. Uh, But without a doubt, the first thing you notice when you land is everybody wearing the red and black. And that raised questions, what is this team? What is Flamengo? Uh, Well, I'd later go on to find out it was Flamengo. But... It turns out that the Maracanã is quite the staple of Rio de Janeiro. So I was fortunate enough to do a stadium tour. And in the stadium, they have a museum of all the history of the stadium. And while there is a lot of history of Fluminense, it is without a doubt Flamengo's home. So it was really cool. It was a really awesome experience. And I have pictures, but they're all ruined by the fact that it's Fluminense. The seats are set up for a Fluminense game, not Flamengo. But yeah, and I believe it was that same day that I went to the Maracanã that I bought my first Flamengo shirt, which I'm wearing right now. So. Nice, nice. And were you a fan of, of of soccer or football before this? Or had you kind of just arrived and touched down in Brazil not knowing much about the game um, and you were just, you just through those experiences became not only a fan of Flamengo, but uh, of the sport itself. Yeah, that's a good question. I was definitely a fan of the sport, but baseball has always been my number one sport. So I didn't follow soccer or football super closely. I, I had been watching a couple matches on TV here and there. I obviously played FIFA growing up. That was, I think everybody, even if you like the sport or not, would play FIFA. For but sure. I'd never really had a team either. Kind of like Enric, I, I did lean towards Barcelona just because that's where Messi was playing. It's, it's talk of the town. People who don't even support Barcelona still wear the shirts here. So, yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, and so... 
let's let's just get right into the kind of the breakdown of the team this year. Um, kind of a bumpy period in the middle. Um, but overall, it's a it's a pretty strong squad. You know, how do you feel about the team um, as a whole right now? Are you confident um, that the the team as it's built right now can can go and win some trophies, or do you think that you know there's areas where you guys need to improve, whether bringing up youngsters or uh, through the transfer window? This season feels very similar to last year, and. While I only became a fan in 2021, I've heard it's a constant thing with Flamengo to start the year off a little rocky and turn it into a solid season. So while it definitely wasn't the start Flamengo was hoping for and Vitor Pereira didn't really work out, I'm still hopeful that maybe we can have a similar ending to the year like last season where we ended up winning the Copa do Brasil and the Libertadores. The Brazil around might be a little out of reach just considering how dominant uh, Botafogo and Palmeiras are this season. Palmeiras is always a tough team to beat. But in regards to what I think we need to change, every single time Flamengo plays their young players, our young stars, it just feels like they have that passion that some of our veterans lack. So I'd love to see more playing time from people like Mateus Franca and maybe a little less of Vidal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, Mateus Franca is actually a name that I had here um, as a highly promising youngster. Um, and I mean, Flamengo over the years, of course, has has produced a lot of, of kids. Um, you know, it, it, as we kind of look to um you know throughout the season and that you're you're getting towards the what they call silly season in in Europe and maybe the possibility of some of the kids moving uh, abroad um uh, do you see that happening to any of flamengo's young kids or do you think they're going to they're going to stick around for you know at least the end of the year and and hopefully beyond that i would love to see them stay i know mateus franca and matuzinho they've both been linked to europe but I really hope Flamengo can hold on to them. Even if they sell them at the end of the year, I, I feel like they're very important young players to this team. I could see Flamengo selling some of our veteran players. Even today, uh, as we're recording this, Mourinho just left for Fortaleza. I know a lot of people didn't like him, but there's definitely room for Flamengo to make some additions and also sell some players. The young players... I think Flamengo needs to hold on to them. If they're going to, I can't say for sure. All right. So a question that I had as well is Flamengo's stadium situation. So obviously, like Flamengo, uh, there's other teams throughout the world. Like uh, what comes to mind right now is Inter and Milan that both play in San Siro. They're deciding to sp uh, split up soon. So one team, each team is going to have a different stadium and Probably the same thing will happen to Flamengo because uh, both them and Fluminense, none of them own uh, Maracanã, so it's a stadium from the Silesau. And what do you think of the situation at the moment? Are you maybe afraid that a split can decrease the number of fans attending matches or the overall marketing that works for the squad? Well, one of my biggest issues with the Maracanã is the fact that Flamengo does not own it. It's been a little annoying seeing Vasco da Gama playing in the Maracanã as I view that as Flamengo's home. I don't even view it as Fluminense's home. But in regards to building a new stadium, obviously there's some positives. And the Maracanã, the actual field itself, has not been in great condition lately. I think they just invested some more money into improving the grass. But... I think a new stadium would be beneficial for Flamengo, and I don't think they'd have any problem bringing in the same amount of fans. But the Maracanã, when I think of the Maracanã, I think of Flamengo. So I hope there's a way Flamengo can manage to stay, but maybe eliminate some of those issues. You know, you just mentioned uh, two clubs, uh, two of the, um, the other big four, uh, or the other three of the big four, uh, of Rio de Janeiro, uh, obviously Fluminense and Vasco, which you just mentioned, and then of course Botafogo rounding out the big four. 
Curious to know um, from your perspective, anyone that follows you on Twitter knows that you are a great troll of Vasco da Gama um, and Fluminense, of course. Who could forget your uh, your legendary um, paper shredder tweet? Um, but, uh, you know, I'm curious to hear what you think and how you think about those rivalries. You know, who is who would you say is um, your biggest rival uh, of amongst those three? Uh, in the city of Rio de Janeiro. There's something about Vasco da Gama that is so easy to hate, but obviously don't take my Twitter too seriously as I <laughs> like to have some fun on there. I, I get on some people's nerves and that's kind of the fun of it, I suppose. But Vasco da Gama is the team I despise the most, but at the same time, they're not that good right now. So it's it's one of those things where it feels like you're punching down all the time. And that, I mean, that could be seen as disrespectful, but it is what it is, I suppose. Fluent NC, it's what makes that rivalry special is that they are a solid team at the moment. And every match, it feels like it's a toss up. I always think Flamengo will come out on top, but they have some really good players. Obviously, the Campeonato Carioca final did not go Flamengo's way. Uh, and some people might see it differently, but Lotofogo, I don't have too much of an issue with. Maybe it just has to do with when I started becoming a fan of Flamengo. But I put it this way. I know some really good Botafogo supporters. I don't know many Fluminense or Vasco supporters that I actually care to talk to. But uh, for instance, Glorious Botafogo, he's a good guy. So I don't have much of an issue with Botafogo, but... I hope Vasco gets relegated and Fluminense. I hope one day to see them relegated. So, <laughs> uh, all right, all right, yeah, and and big shout out to Pete uh, from Glorious Botafogo. Uh, we both uh, have done some some content with him, and you're right, he's a he's a great guy. So, um, moving on. I mean, we've talked a lot about the Americana, so many memories, so many uh, historic wins and losses, and and trials and tribulations. Um, obviously, you know, um, uh, none of us are lifelong Brasilia Real fans, uh, but you've been a, a supporter of Flamengo in probably one of the golden ages of this club. Um, what have, what are kind of some of your favorite memories over the last few years that, that, uh, ha have kind of stuck with you that, um, that you've really enjoyed, uh, as, as a part of this fan base? Yeah, I do have an interesting perspective becoming a fan when Flamengo is near their peak as we've been winning a lot of championships. The first championship I watched was the unfortunate 2021 Libertadores against Palmeiras. And that has left me with many nightmares. Andres Pereira, that mistake still kills me to this day. But my favorite moments are without a doubt last year when Dorval Jr. came into the club. He turned around the culture. Paulo Sosa uh, just was a failure. And that actually is what got me into YouTube as my first video was about Paulo Sosa being fired. But Dorval Jr. was a pleasure to watch. We won the Copa do Brasil and we won the Libertadores uh, so seeing the difference between losing the Libertadores and then having that really poor start to the season in 2022, but finishing with two championships, that is something that I'm going to remember for as long as I continue to support Flamengo, which will obviously be forever. But Yeah, and there have been definitely tournaments that Flamengo had the capacity to win it, but just couldn't get that last match. And as we saw in many different finals in the last years, uh, I wanted to mention Flamengo's recent performances because um, they actually started the season not too good. Uh, as you said, with managers, uh, at, when you started your YouTube channel, managers that got fired, and then the same thing happened to Vitor Pereira and Sampali coming and getting him as a new coach. So Flamengo hasn't actually lost a match since May 7th, and that was a 2-1 loss against Atletico Paranaense. How do you think the team has changed uh, compared to Vitor Pereira, uh, the manager that they started the season with and played in Campeonato Carioca, and shifting to a probably different style of coach like Sampaoli? Uh, I think 
he was at Santos. Uh, he managed Argentina, went to different clubs, uh, most recently in Marseille. So how has that helped uh, Flamengo grow as a team and bringing back the era when they had Dorival Jr. last year? Yeah, it's a culture shift for sure. As with Vitor Pereira, it really felt like each Flamengo player was just that, a player. There was no team atmosphere. If there's one thing that I give a ton of credit to Sampoli, it's that he seems to have united the locker room. We feel like a team again, and you can see that in the fact that Flamengo has not lost in their last 10 matches we're on a four-game winning streak at the moment. Uh, even today, Jimmy Butler, the basketball player, came to uh, Flamengo's practice, and you could see that Flamengo's players were united. They were having fun. That is something that I really did not see with Vitor Pereira. So it's definitely the unity in the locker room that's the biggest difference and why Flamengo has been successful lately. Yeah, that's that's great to hear. I mean, I'm a big fan of Jorge Sampaoli. Um, you know, I, it takes time to to build that culture, and and that's that's awesome to hear that you know they're uh, they're back to having fun um, uh, and, and enjoying their game, and and even kind of the the style in which uh, Jorge Sampaoli plays, I think, um, uh, is referred to as love for the ball, amor para el balón, and um, and uh, you know what more could you give you know a football player than 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 a lot of possession, a lot of ball, uh, and it, it's got to be really enjoyable to play under him. And and I, I've been a fan of his, uh, especially after his um, his great success at Santos, achieving that that second uh, second place finish uh, to your Flamengo. Um, and actually, Peter, he is the manager that uh, we wanted to get him as well. We talked about him in the podcast recently so much that, hey, we need a new coach. Uh, like, this guy's not working. This guy's not working. And Sampoli was a free man. And uh, looking at how Flamengo got it, maybe we're a bit jealous. And currently, we're suffering with uh, Odario Hellman. But I'm glad that he made it and came back to Brasileira. I think it fits him well. And he can do crazy things uh, with Santos. Uh, or with Flamengo as he did with Santos. So we're going to have to wait and see, and maybe uh, Flamengo can win some important titles in the future. Yeah. And, and speaking of titles, I mean, Flamengo, they're in a much better position now in the Brasileirao than they were uh, when Jorge Sampaoli took over. Uh, they are in a good position in Libertadores. Um but we we keep alluding to this this segment of the season where they had some some real issues. Uh, they last they lost the Recopa, they lost the Club World Cup, um, and then they lost uh, both kind of segments of the Campeonato Carioca um, to to Fluminense. Um, curious to hear kind of what your thoughts were going through those tournaments, and you know I guess you could say lucky or you know whatever, but. These are kind of the tournaments and the trophies that are on a maybe a um, a lower rung. So I'm curious to hear kind of what your thoughts are on the importance of those trophies. Obviously, you always want to do well, but given the choice between Brasileirao and Carioca, I'm sure many people would 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 prefer Brasileirao. So um, the, I'll just I'll leave you with that, and uh, you can kind of tell us your thoughts. Yeah, those trophies at the beginning of the year, there were things that we desperately wanted to win. But I do believe the Brazil around the Copa do Brazil and the Libertadores are at a higher pedestal. You could say the Club World Cup is obviously important. And that hurt. The Club World Cup was disappointing. All the talk going into it was the final. It's going to be Real Madrid and Flamengo. And obviously Flamengo. Uh, we lost to Al Hilal, I believe, and ended up getting third place. So all the talk was Real Madrid and Flamengo, and we didn't even get to that point. That was a disappointment. The Recopa, Independiente del Valle is a really good team, but again, that's a match Flamengo on paper should be winning. And the Campeonato Carioca, while it is seen as a preseason tournament, it's against your rivals in Fluminense. And I believe Flamengo won the first leg of that uh, championship and we blew it in the second leg. That was really disappointing. And 
talk about me being on Twitter, I heard a lot from Fluminense <laughs> fans as I got a little cocky after the first leg and obviously quite the disappointment in the second leg. But those tournaments and those championships, while they would have been nice, I think most Flamengo fans would agree that Brazil are out of the Copa do Brazil and the Libertadores are a little more important than that. So I have high hopes for the end of the year. I think it's possible that Flamengo can repeat with the Copa do Brazil and the Libertadores. And I'm yet to see Flamengo win the Brazil route as I joined just a little after our most recent championship. So that's going to be tough. As I said earlier, Botafogo has been really good. Palmeiras is always good. But I would not count Flamengo out. And another thing I wanted to add is uh, that match against Al Hilal was a must win game. And for Flamengo to not maybe reach the final and play against possibly Real Madrid was terrible. And if they couldn't do it back then, a couple of months ago, it could get even harder if they win Copa Libertadores this season because Man City is in the tournament and Al Itihad, where Benzema just moved in. Benzema could be playing against, let's say, Flamengo if they win Copa Libertadores. So that's even harder to play a player of uh, that capacity for the squad. But uh, as a team, uh, Flamengo has had so many stars and maybe they can cooperate and do something different and win those titles. Yeah, the Al-Halal game, that's a match that Flamengo should win still. And I'll tell you what, on Twitter, again, going back to Twitter, the Al-Halal fans are ruthless. They do not let you hear the end of that. Uh, Real Madrid, though, was a really good team, and I really wish we would have gone to that final. Next season, if we manage to make it again, Manchester City, that is a tough team with Holland. I had the privilege of watching Manchester City last July when they came to Lambeau Field in Wisconsin, and that was a preseason game against Bayern Munich. And even in that preseason match where there's not much to play for, they were dominant. They uh, ended up beating Bayern Munich, who obviously also won the Bundesliga. So Manchester City coming off a treble, Erling Holland, I would play some even above Mbappe at this point in time. So that would be a tough match, but I think Flamengo could turn a lot of people's eyes and I think they could impress a lot of people. Uh, not to make any predictions, but if we were to make it to a final against Manchester City, I would not count Flamengo out. I think they could pull off an upset, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done before we can even start that conversation. Yeah, and you said about the match uh, for Man City and Bayern. I regret not going to that game last year. Maybe it was a long drive, uh, like six, seven hours. But uh, Peter told me a couple of days ago that Sevilla and Crystal Palace are coming in to play in Detroit this summer. And actually, three days later, it will be Man or Chelsea Dortmund in Chicago. So... That's another possibility that us, and including you as well, going uh, down the south can go in that stadium. But either way, uh, going back to Flamengo, uh, how privileged do you feel uh, as a team? Because all these retired players that play in Europe or other continents try to tend to finish their career in Flamengo, including Arturo Vidal that came from Inter, David Luiz after having a career with Chelsea and Arsenal. Pablo, I think he went from Bur he came from Bordeaux. Diego Alves, the uh, Valencia goalkeeper, Julius Cesar that played for Inter, and so on, with so many other names like Rafinha, Pablo Mari, Mauricio Isla, and Felipe Luis. Uh, how do you feel about all these stars? And I was talking to Peter as well. Um, maybe you can you guys can possibly have Neymar. That's something that I don't want I don't want to see, but it could be a possibility. Is that something that makes you happy as a Flamengo fan? Well, yeah, Neymar even recently posted a picture with the Santos shirt, so maybe that gave you guys some hope. But if Neymar were to come back, I think he would likely join Flamengo, and I'd love to see that. But without a doubt, having all these star players coming to Flamengo, it's exciting. These are names people know around the world. Even before I started following football very closely, I knew of people like David Luiz and Arturo Vidal. These are household names if you even somewhat follow the sport. So it's very exciting. I think 
part of the issue is you don't want people to see Flamengo as a retirement destination. You still want them to compete at a high level. I think David Luiz has done a pretty good job of that, and I've been really impressed with his most recent performances. He made a really good diving stop against Gremio the other day. Uh, so I've been impressed with him. Arturo Vidal, a lot of the Flamengo community does not really like him at the moment. I don't have too much of an issue with him, but uh, people people have been rubbed the wrong way by some of his uh, posts on social media, and it seems like he has a desire to go back to Chile, maybe with Colo Colo to end his career. But it's definitely exciting to have these big name players come in, and it's nice to know that the door is never closed on coming to Flamengo for a lot of these stars. Yeah. And I think it's, I love what you said about the fact that it's important to make sure that this league and these clubs aren't retirement leagues and not retirement clubs. Um, you know, I like, I think a lot of people would maybe consider MLS or some of the, the golf uh, leagues. China was that way for a while. Um, and there, there, you know, there are a few other leagues around the world that kind of had that reputation. I think it's a desire, like a deserved reputation. Um, I don't think Brazil is that way, certainly. Um, and I think it's, it's super important to remember that and to keep it that way. Um, just, just today we had some news, unfortunately, you know, uh, Flamengo, not the only team that attracts big name stars, uh, that are coming from Europe. Luis Suarez may be, uh, may be suffering a, a knee injury that may lead to his retirement. Speculation, is this a backdoor to enter Miami? Uh, but regardless, it does look like uh, the Brasi de Rao uh, may lose another huge name and star. Um, but uh, it's nice knowing that a team like Flamengo can can uh, attract players even in their primes. You know, Everton, um, Cebolina is... A great player. I thought he wasn't too bad at Benfica, um, but you know he chooses to come back permanently to Flamengo uh, and be a star in his native Brazil. Uh, when I think he could probably comfortably play in, in a lot of leagues in Europe, which is which is nice. Same thing with Pedro as well. He he maybe didn't have the best time at Fiorentina, um, and he comes back and and you know he's a star um, in, in Brazil, though the, the recent dip of form obviously included. Um, but like I mentioned earlier, and like you alluded to, we Flamengo have a bunch of young stars. Um, curious to hear what kind of you think is the right mix of veteran players and young stars, because obviously with Brazil, there's it's an exporting country, right? They export talent, young talent to the, the wealthy leagues uh, around the world. So that means a constant conveyor belt of, of young talent coming through and, and being sold. Um, curious to hear kind of what your, uh, you know, if Owen Sullivan is the, is the director of, of Flamengo, like, how are you building that team? How many veterans, how many young guns, you know, what's you, what's, what do you think is the mix that, that leads to championships? That's a good question. And if I were Flamengo, I would not hire me as the director. <laughs> I've only, I'm not huge on the tactics and all of that, but my test is the eyeball test, and it seems like Flamengo, when you have a, not a 50-50 split, but maybe something closer to 65% veterans compared to the younger players. And by veterans, I don't necessarily mean 35 years old on your way out, but well-established players, I think that's where you have your best outcome. I don't think you lean in to a full youth squad, obviously, like you would see in the Campeonato Carioca. But I will tell you, that team had a lot of passion in the preseason tournament, and you're not going to get as many good results that way, but it's exciting to watch. Now, I think you need to perhaps uh, integrate your younger players, not necessarily starting, but have them on the bench and ready to go as they have the fresh legs, a lot of the veteran players, you can see, they're kind of trudging along near the end of the match. So I'm not the best person to ask about uh, what your starting 11 should be and who's on the bench, but I definitely think there's room for both and you can integrate them both. 
Nice. And you talked about this earlier. Um, you as a fan of Flamengo started uh, doing uh, something really great in YouTube. Uh, you are Flamengo's number one English YouTube channel. What made you want to do this? Was this maybe a sort of reaction after the manager was fired, as you mentioned earlier, or was it like a desire inside you to do something uh, related to the club? Yeah, it was a reaction to Paulo Sosa being fired. But if you go back and watch that video, it is like 13 seconds long. It is a quickly thrown together video, but I wanted to kind of get my feet in the water. And I started making my videos probably less than a minute long at the beginning and working my way up. Now I tend to try and hit a four minute mark, but re really what it stemmed from is I was supporting Flamengo for about a year at that point and it is hard to follow some of these Brazilero teams if you really only speak English there is a Flamengo English Twitter page which is excellent but they don't have a YouTube channel uh, Flamengo they have the Fla TV channel but that's Portuguese it is challenging I'm trying to learn the language but I try to view it as how was I feeling? I, I struggled to follow the team at times. So by posting videos, even if they were only a minute or two long in English, that made it accessible to more people. And I knew that there was a hole in the market for that. If there was somebody already posting videos like I was doing, chances are I would not have even started YouTube. But the end goal for me is to try and make Flamengo more accessible I, I would love to see Flamengo make an official English YouTube channel, but I enjoy what I'm doing and it kind of caught on. Uh, I was my first few videos, I was probably talking to virtually nobody, maybe five people. I think I had established a very small Twitter following before I started YouTube, but we're talking in the tens, not even close to where I am now. So it was a market that I felt was untapped and a market that I wish people had already been in. So it's really just about spreading my love for Flamengo at the end of the day. And I, I'm not the most knowledgeable on the sport and there are people way smarter than me on these topics, but I enjoy doing it now and it's kind of caught on. It's gained a following. Now some of my videos are getting a couple hundred viewers, which is just awesome. But without a doubt, what you guys are doing is far more impressive than what I'm doing. You guys are making weekly, if not more than a couple times a week, podcasts are hour, like over an hour long, and I'm making a few minutes uh, long YouTube videos. So uh, I, it is an honor to be on the 50th episode. So thank you for that. Yeah, definitely appreciate it. And, we, uh, you know, Enric and I, I think, Maybe flattery makes us uncomfortable. We really enjoy it. Uh, and um, we appreciate, uh, you know, you saying that because um, kind of leading into my my next few questions here, um, you have a big following. You've accumulated thousands, literally, uh, of, of, of people who interact with your tweets and uh, watch your videos and, uh, and comment. And, um, you know, you're a force in, uh, in the... Um, in the Flamengo community, regardless of language. So it's, it's great hearing that from you kind of leading me into my next question here. Um, you know, you've amassed thousands of followers between Twitter and YouTube comments, interactions, um, tons of engagement. The impressions are always through the roof, especially when you, um, you know, you're tweeting about Flamengo or, or, or on topic stuff. And, and when you were we retweet our stuff as well, uh, which is always appreciated, but I'm curious to hear kind of about your growth. Um, is it mostly, do you think, uh, Brazilians, um, or do you have, uh, kind of a grasp on how many people from like, um, the, like the Anglo sphere or the English speaking world? Uh, that are maybe following and maybe even being pulled into um, uh, to Brazilian football uh, through your channel? Well, starting out with my channel, the plan was originally uh, bring in people who don't necessarily support the team or struggle to support the team uh, if they only speak English. But funny enough, 
I have about 7,000 followers on Twitter, maybe 3,000 subscribers on YouTube. And a very large portion of them are Brazilians who are embracing me. And that is very appreciated as it's kind of uh, not what I saw, uh, not what I thought was going to happen necessarily, but it's been awesome. I've been embraced. I do have some followers who are pretty active who are from English speaking countries, don't speak any Portuguese. And that's also awesome to see. But without a doubt, the majority of the people who follow me speak Portuguese and they actually use it as a tool to get better with their own English, which is awesome. That's not anything I uh, could have dreamt of. I didn't realize that me posting everything in English would allow uh, Brazilians and Portuguese speakers, even Spanish speakers to improve their English, which is awesome. I'm glad I could uh, kind of provide a vessel for them to learn more. But yeah, it's overwhelmingly Brazilians, but they're all incredible people. They've embraced me. I'm a foreigner and obviously you deal with some of those haters and there's always going to be people who don't really accept you as their own. Uh, I've dealt with many people who criticize me just because I'm from the United States of America, but you can't let that get to you. Uh, you just have to kind of move on and accept not everybody's going to like you and uh but you should value those that do much higher than those who don't. Yeah, and I definitely agree with you. Uh, there's times that, even you know, for me on Twitter, there's been people asking like, oh, why is this guy talking about Brazilian league? He's just a uh, gringo, as they say, anyone from a foreign country. But while me and you and Peter are interested in Brazilian football, there's definitely people outside, like maybe the fans that follow uh, teams from Champions League or the big five leagues uh, in European football, maybe those guys don't really have an interest on South American football overall unless there's a guy like Vitor Roque or Enrique coming into a big team and now they want to discover what that talent is actually doing. So what suggestion do you have for these type of people that don't have any interest at all about Brazilian football and are sort of missing out of all this action that we get to see in a daily basis. Uh, maybe not every day, but every two or three days, there's a team that plays and there's so many games that we enjoy uh, as fans. Yeah, if you're watching the Premier League, if you're watching La Liga, you are benefiting directly from the product of the Brazil Rao. So I would give it a chance. These people, uh, the, the fans of the Premier League, La Liga, um, all of those major leagues in Europe, chances are the team you support has a Brazilian on them, and chances are that Brazilian came originally from the Brazil route. So it's an exciting league. It's a young league. You do have the veteran players, obviously, but it's really an honor to watch all these young players develop, and you see these 16, 17, 18-year-old players who light up the field uh, Palmeiras has many of them, obviously, and Victor Hoque, incredible player. And you get to see them play while they're young. And Flamengo, I missed the window, but obviously we had Vinicius Jr., we had Keita, these incredible players who are household names in Europe coming from Flamengo. So I think there's something special about seeing their career in full seeing where they came from and where they're going and hopefully coming back to again in the future. But I think the Brazil route is incredibly underrated. A lot of South American football is. So to the people that don't give it a chance, I would say watch a couple of matches, even just watch the Libertadores and you will be impressed. Yeah, absolutely. There's so much quality um, I mean, and you can just even look through the names at a team like Flamengo and you can see all these players with tons of European pedigree and players like we mentioned before that, you know, have the capability and the skills to play in Europe. And, you know, for whatever reason, they feel more comfortable in Brazil um, and that's where they choose to be. Players like Gabriel Barbosa, obviously, in Everton, which we mentioned. Um, speaking of quality. Uh, I want to kind of shift gears because uh, as we speak, the match hasn't happened, but by the time this will come out, uh, we will know the result 
of the match uh, between Flamengo, your team, and Santos, the team of our hearts. Um, although many would probably say they can already guess the results. Um, but I want to turn back the clock. I know you weren't uh, a supporter at this time, but one of the most iconic um, uh, matches in Brazilian history, it's certainly in recent history, has been um, the incredible nine-goal thriller, Santos 4, Flamengo 5 in 2011. You had um, uh, Ronaldinho on Flamengo, of course, and you had Neymar on on Santos. Um, I believe that was the game that Neymar scored the Puskas winning goal that year. Um, So, so much history tied in with that. Um, I'm curious to hear kind of... um, if you've watched maybe that game or the highlights of that game, kind of your thoughts on, um, on, on that. And, you know, if you go back into the archives, obviously you're a much newer fan, but do you ever find yourself just on YouTube looking at some of the highlights of um, some, uh, some of the iconic moments in, in Flamengo's history? Oh, definitely. And I've, I've seen Neymar's highlight reel without a doubt from when he was with Santos the match in particular, I've definitely seen clips, but I would love to take the opportunity to go back and watch the full match if I can find it. But I enjoy watching the highlights of the matches before I was supporting the club as there is so much history to Flamengo, over 100 years of history, and I've only been here for two of them. So it's a lot of fun to see what came before me and it's exciting to know that while I missed out on a hundred years, I'm going to see decades and decades into the future with this team. Speaking of the rivalry, there's without a doubt a rivalry with Flamengo and Santos. When you talk to people here in the United States, if they know any Brazilian team, chances are it is Santos, which is funny because Flamengo obviously is the most supported team in Brazil, but Santos is very well known, famous with Pele. Every American, whether they watch soccer or football or not, they know of Pele. Obviously, he played for New York for a couple of years, but it's an exciting match coming up. Uh, By the time this podcast is out, it will already have happened. But even though Santos isn't having the greatest season to this point, it's always a tough match. And that's going to be a fun one to watch. Santos is an exciting team, uh, but I'm cheering for Flamengo all the way. And I think Flamengo will win with relative ease, but you can't ever write off Santos, in my opinion. Just a very historic matchup coming up. And just to answer your question earlier, uh, if you, in case you want to watch that whole match, uh, not replay and highlights, there's a channel on YouTube called Raptimo TV or Raptimo Videos. So they release full 90-minute uh, replays. And even if a, there's a game that happened in 2004, the the quality of the video is so good that it feels like you're watching it at this moment in 2023. So it's just incredible. As Peter mentioned, so many goals scored and a historic game. But uh, this is a question that we haven't really asked people before. Our guests, and you're the first one, you sort of talked about how you view Santos uh nowadays and how you feel about them as a team do you think we're capable of winning any championship or is it like as if you're watching Bahia or Curitiba one of those teams where actually that's where we finish around in Brasile Rao 10th 12th 13th so it hasn't been good in the recent years yeah my perspective from becoming a fan when I have Santos I view as a very average team Obviously, they have so much history and uh, they've had a lot of success historically. But my view of Santos is that they are a middle of the table team at the moment. But I have a lot of respect for them and that respect will not go away whether Santos finishes at the bottom of the table or the top of the table. I'm going to respect Santos and their history. But every time Flamengo is playing Santos, this upcoming match... It is a game that Flamengo, I expect to win 10 out of 10 times. So anything other than a victory would be a disappointment in my eyes. Even a draw, I would view in a negative fashion. It's nothing 
against Santos. It's just the way things have been, especially this season. I think Flamengo is very capable of winning that match. And looking at the history as well between those two teams, uh, they have done a lot of business in, in the past. Looking at the, some of the transfers that happened in the past decade, uh, I would mention Gabigol, Diago Maia, Mourinho, and Bruno Enrique, all these guys, and probably many more came from Santos. So do you sort of have a compassion about the the Villa Belmiro squad that we support uh, when you look at all these guys that are coming in, maybe it's thanks to Santos and all these legends that they're selling them to us. And I think Flamengo wasn't a team that had a lot of money. They spent a little, maybe around the 2011, 2012, 2013 seasons. And then boom, in 2016, started uh, getting all this money out of nowhere and getting all these players. I think Gabi Gol is their most expensive signing uh, around 18 million. Uh, back in 2018, 2019. So that's a lot of money for uh, your, a Brazilian team to do that. And he sort of paid them back. He won the Copa Libertadores for them. And overall, again, what do you think about these guys um, when they're helping out Flamengo? That's an incredible list of players. Uh, Gabby Gol, arguably Flamengo's best player of all time. I would still put Zico higher, but a phenomenal player and he's on path to break a lot of records. He's already proven that he is here to stay. One thing about Gabby goal is that he seems dedicated to Flamengo. It doesn't seem like he has any intention to leave uh, Bruno Henrique. He is my favorite player. The very first Flamengo match I watched was against Sao Paulo and Bruno scored a hat trick. It was phenomenal. He scored three goals, I believe, in seven or eight minutes. A very small window. Just super impressive. Uh, last year, he got hurt. Was out for 10 months, which was really hard to see. But he scored against Gremio, which was phenomenal. That was an emotional goal. It was his first goal since coming back from injury. So there's... Just a just those two players alone are incredible players that we got from Santos. So there is a big respect to Santos uh, in that regard. And hopefully for the upcoming game, neither of these guys end up scoring against Santos. I would be pissed off if they do. And we all know what happened last time they played in uh, Villa Belmiro uh, last year. Uh, Gabi Gol. Some fans, uh, I don't know if you guys watch, some fans uh, actually offered him in the pitch money, like, hey, I'm paying you, just come back. And he was like sort of saying like, no, 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 like, come on, is that even a joke? And then a couple of minutes later, he went on, scored and never ending celebrations that I can't agree with. And hopefully he doesn't repeat that again. It's so shambolic. And even Everton re or. Everton Cebolinha scoring against Gremio. I was not a fan of uh, him doing that because it's his former club. And still, uh, it's something that when these guys scores, uh, the best that they can do is just raise their hands like this. And it's the best reaction that even if you're playing for Gremio or for play, playing uh, for Santos, the fans will appreciate it. Yeah, that's one area that I agree with you. I don't like those type of celebrations against your former clubs. I think obviously people have their own experiences. The players, they can only speak to what they experienced, but I feel like you should have a little higher level of respect in that regard. I think there's room for uh, elaborate celebrations and there's room for a little trolling, you could say, but sometimes I feel like it goes a little over the top, maybe a little too disrespectful. When you're spending as much time as you do with these teams, I think there needs to just be a little higher level of respect. But yeah, I agree with you about that. Yeah, I I totally agree with both of you. I, and I think especially um, in the case, I hated to see Gabriel, but Bruno Henrique doesn't bother me. I think especially for the club that that raised you, um, and uh, and you know especially with Gabriel Barbosa, I mean, with his loan to Santos after basically being chased out of both Inter and Benfica saved his career and earned him that move to, to Flamengo. So um, I was disappointed to see that. I don't like that. Um, same thing with Cebolinha. Um, But I mean, I do get 
And the one thing I will always respect about Gabriel Barbosa is even though he does do that, he goes out of his way to um, to tell and say his appreciation to uh, this, both the city of Santos and the, the club um, in interviews and, and things um, uh, that have come out since the, the move and his success there. Um, he's always made reference to that. So that is much appreciated. And also on his loyalty, uh, Owen, I'm not sure if you saw this. I mean, these are probably just the bottom of the barrel Twitter rumors, but uh, there were some Mexican sources saying that he had a big, huge offer from Club America in uh, in Mexico. And, um, you know, I'm kind of with you. I think it didn't it doesn't matter if he was making a billion dollars a day in Saudi or Mexico City or wherever. Um, you know, I think he's, he wants to be in Brazil and Rio de Janeiro um, and uh, he wants to be there. So um, Gabriel Rosa. Interesting character, but, um, you know, he's kind of all right in my eyes, I guess. Uh... Yeah, he he's not for everybody. One thing I hear all the time on the broadcast of the matches, uh, shout out Mauricio Destri. Definitely. But definitely, he's phenomenal. But one thing I hear all the time is that if you are not a Flamengo supporter, chances are you cannot stand Gabby Goal <laughs> and his eccentric style of play, his... Uh, wearing his emotions on his sleeve very often. And it's one of those things where I struggle with it because I'm not a fan of that play style, but also it is directly benefiting Flamengo at many times. So it's one of those things where I can put it to the side and not let it bother me too much. Uh, but I can definitely see how supporters of other clubs would not like it. They'd view it as disrespectful. But yeah, I, I hope Gabby Goal does stay with Flamengo. It seems like he's headed that way where he wants to establish himself as that club legend who maybe he wasn't there his whole career, but he stayed there for a long time and he finished his career with the club. Yeah, and only 26 years old. I mean, he has a real shout at being, you know, like you said, the best player in this club's history, at least in terms of, you know, goals scored, matches played, trophies won. I mean, you think of the pedestal Zico's put on, and rightfully so. But you know, he's only he only had that one Libertadores, I think, in '81. So, um, and obviously, different types of players and different eras. And you know, I don't want to get into the whole comparable thing, but in terms of club legend at Flamengo, Gabriel Barbosa definitely um, putting himself in a great position to be that number one. And by the way, Owen, I don't think we've asked you this. Is Gabigol your favorite player in the team right now, or do you have anyone else in mind? Bruno Henrique is my favorite player because of my introduction to Flamengo. While I had already bought a Flamengo shirt at that point before I saw the first match, it solidified my love for the team when he scored that hat trick. So that will always be something that's uh, special to me personally, and it will place him as my favorite player. I do like Gabby Gold, but I also like Pedro even more. Uh, transfer market has Pedro listed as more valuable than Gabby Gold at the moment, which was kind of uh, incredible to see. Gabby Gold gets the spotlight and he gets the media attention. And I have a lot of respect for him and I'm a big fan of his work. But there are players I do like just a little more. It's not to say that I don't like Gabby because I do like Gabby. But he's not my favorite player on the team at the moment, but I have huge respect for everything he's done for the club. Definitely. All right. Well, we are getting up to that hour point. So before we let you go, Owen, we always do it with all of our guests, I think. Uh, prediction time. All right. Uh, I have a feeling I know where you're going to go with these, but maybe you'll surprise me. Um, all right. So Rossi the Rao. Who is your pick to win it this year? Um, obviously, we know you, the team of your heart, Flamengo, obviously. But who do you think really, realistically, as the table sits right now, uh, who has the best shot and who would you think is going to win the Brasilia Rao? So I'm going to support Flamengo, and I truly believe we can win the league. But I will say this. The three teams at the top, Flamengo, Palmeiras, Botafogo, 
If it's not Flamengo, it will be Palmeiras. I think Botafogo is a phenomenal team this year, and I've been really impressed with how they've played. But I do think, not necessarily crash and burn, but they are going to fall down the table as the season moves along. Flamengo, I think, has a really good shot because only five points behind Botafogo in first place. Um, We started the year off poorly, but... That's five points. Five, five points is some ground you can make up. I don't think it's out of reach. Uh, last year, Flamengo, not a, if Flamengo had started the year off better last year, we maybe could have won the Brazil row. It would have been very tough, but that was a lot of ground to make up. This year, it's only five points at the moment. So I think Flamengo does have a realistic shot. If not Flamengo, it will be Palmeiras, but. It's going to be an exciting uh, rest of the year. So I think a lot could change. Perhaps there could be a couple underdog teams that make their way up the table. But as it sits now, I think Flamengo can pull through. Okay. And, and how about the cup competitions? Who would you think uh, is is best in a position to win Copa do Brazil and Copa Libertadores? I mean, are you thinking maybe this is the year for a legendary treble to uh, to mimic Man City? Well, after watching Man City play this year and seeing the their first match of the season against Bayern Munich in that friendly in Lambeau Field, I am feeling the trouble. <laughs> I think it's going to be a uh, very hard trouble to win. We haven't been that impressive in the Libertadores this year. I think it's one of those things where uh, it's a very possible it's a very possible um, outcome that we could win the trouble if we don't. I really don't know who will win those other competitions. I obviously am backing Flamengo, and there is some bias in that, but I've been impressed with our recent run. Um, so I don't know. It's it's those competitions where it's either Flamengo will win them or they will likely make it to the final or the semifinal. Uh, there is bias in that, obviously, but... I think Flamengo stands a really good chance to at least be in a position where feasibly they could win a treble. And we've had a guest before, a Flamengo fan named uh, Andreas Knudsen. Uh, He said that Flamengo is mostly a cup team. So given that they're both in uh, in both competitions, uh, Copa do Brazil and Libertadores, they can possibly get them both and we'll have to wait and see uh, how those competition will go. In terms of Copa do Brazil, I think they have surpassed the most difficult thing at the moment because having to play Fluminense and I believe round of 16 is sort of terrible given that there's Bahia, there's Santos, there's America, still those types of teams in the play. But either way, Flamengo, ever since uh, Sampaoli has come back, I think they're improving day to day and they can do all of the things that they got done last season. Yeah, it's going to be an exciting finish to the year. And I do agree. Flamengo does feel like a cup team. I think there's a real possibility that it will sort of be a repeat of last year where Flamengo wins the Libertadores and the Copa do Brazil, or at the very least makes it to the final. The Brazil Arau is one of the toughest leagues to win in the world. I I truly believe that. I think it's a lot harder to win in Brazil than many of those countries in Europe if you're a top team. Uh, but Flamengo is a real possibility at the treble. We are a cup team. The Brasileira will be challenging, but I think that's possible. And Owen, where can people find your stuff, uh, your YouTube channel, your social media? Where, if you know, if they want to follow you, learn more about Flamengo, where can they uh, where can they do that? On Twitter, it's Owen Sully123, O W E N S U L L Y123. And YouTube implemented a similar feature. So if you type that in on YouTube, you should be able to find me. Or on YouTube, the channel's just Owen Sullivan. So you can search that or just Owen Sullivan Flamango. Nice. All right. Well, we really appreciate your time. This was awesome. Really, uh, really stoked that we finally got you on. Um, go follow him. Um, and, uh, we will have to check in with you, uh, later in the season. Uh, hopefully you'll be able to celebrate, you know, a trophy or two. 
Um, and uh, yeah, hopefully it's a, it's a great match uh, this weekend. So thanks again for joining and uh, we will see everyone next time. Have a great night.